All right, we're ready for our intermediate clutch. We got four frictions, four steels, no cushion plate, all right? No cushion plate in the early units. So in either 96 or 97, and I'll have to annotate because I'm not exactly sure, the uh, piston changed and GM started to install a kind of a three or four legged cushion plate and it uh, necessitated a change in the thickness of the friction. So these frictions are all 80 thousandths thick. Late models with the uh, cushion plate, they went to a 70 thousandths thick friction. And so you wanna be careful when you're mixing and matching parts. If you don't know that, I guess you do now, but um, you may find yourself a little tight if you try to put an early clutch pack into a late unit with a uh, cushion plate. Now, if you don't wanna run the cushion plate because maybe you're running like a high stall application, you're racing or whatever the case may be, then you're gonna to have to get the uh, right mix of frictions and steels in this clutch to keep to your generally 10 thousandths per friction. So I wanna see between 40 and 50 thou. And how I manage to that is two different intermediate clutch snap rings. Okay? Now, from the factory, this snap ring that comes in here is not selective. It's this one right here, okay? These are 90 thousandths thick, 90 to 92 thousandths and uh, they're flimsy, number one, so you always replace them, but there's not different thicknesses of snap ring to allow you to make some subtle adjustments to your clearance. So what we have are two Chrysler 727 direct clutch drum snap rings. One's 88 thousandths thick and the other is 106 thousandths thick. So typically I'm good with the 88 thousandths, but if I have to use the 106 thousandths to just, you know, maybe I'm way loose, then I can do that. Now with the intermediates, the more clearance you have, all other things equal, the firmer it's gonna shift, okay? You don't need to do nothing with the feed hole sizes in the plate. You don't need to install any kind of valve body kit or anything else that would otherwise um, produce a firmer one-two shift. Just make the clearance a little bit on the higher side of spec and you'll have a firmer shift. Now. Uh, I wouldn't recommend getting crazy, especially with a stock stall application because you do run the risk of having too harsh a shift and besides being unpleasant to drive, uh, you can have issues potentially with either destroying the intermediate sprag, especially on the early units that have the uh, 16 element there. Um, you know, we're using a 34 element, but um, even then that sprag can be vulnerable too under real high performance applications. But the bottom line is you don't want to take a chance on you know, blowing out case lugs with a super harsh shift combined with high line pressure. So those are the concerns that you want to mitigate when it comes to the one, two transition. So your intermediate frictions and you know, you have these gaps here. Okay. There's a gap here. Um, I'm not exactly sure where this is supposed to be oriented. So I'll just orient it here, kind of in the middle. I'll, I personally don't think it matters at all, but. And between now and when I'm ready to do anything further, I'll check my footage and see how they were coming out. So new steels, you can reuse your steels like I mentioned before, but I mean, I think the steel module for these is like 120 bucks, $125, something like that. And um, it's worth doing. So hopefully that was in focus. I don't know if it was or not. All right. So I'm gonna install first my 88,000 thick snap ring. Alright, so here they are visually it's gonna be actually I think this might they might both be eighty eight thousand. Let me go get the hundred and five thousand. Yeah, we got uh, two eighty-eight thousand thick snap rings. So this is what they look like. All 
All right, we'll start with 88, and then we'll see if we need to do anything beyond that. If I'm looking here, where the backing plate is situated relative to that lug, I'm thinking I'm gonna be a little, a little stout on clearance. So let me try the 105, 106 thousand stick snap ring first and see what that does for me. A little stout with the 88. Okay, we wanna pay a little bit more attention to clutch clearance here, especially given the customer's initial concern about a harsh one-two shift. So we don't want to get too aggressive with the clearance. And I'm sorry this is sloppy, but the tripod's kind of in the way. All right, let's see what we have. Okay, that feels just about right, actually. All right, I'm gonna do a quick air check. Make sure everything's actually working. And then we'll assess just by eye what the clearance is likely to be. Okay, the hissing you're hearing is coming out of the back of that nozzle. So apply is good. All right, let me uh, situate my dial indicator and then we'll take an actual reading and see where we're at. All right, dial indicator's in position. I'm using an extra forward clutch hub to support the uh, base, keep it stable. So I make sure it's right at zero and then we're gonna go ahead and put some air in the intermediate feed and see where we're at. So it's not quite returning to zero. So it looks like 56 thousandths. Yeah, 55, 56. Let me zoom in a little bit so you can see the indicator more clearly. Okay, it looks like 58, 59 thousandths. Fifty-nine thou. That's going to be on the high side. So, let me see if I have a slightly thicker snap ring somewhere. Maybe another ten thousandths. I don't think I do. I think a hundred and six thousandths is as thick as they go. But let me see what I can come up with, and then uh, we'll resume. All right. So what I have here is a TH four hundred steel for an intermediate, and it's going to be a little thicker. So, we have. 96 thousandths. Here's our 480 E steel. This is going to be the bottom steel. It's 75 thousandths. So this should close the gap for us. Okay, anytime you move to a thicker steel plate than the clutch otherwise takes, you always want to put the thick steel on the bottom of the clutch um, next to the piston or on top of the piston. Uh, reason being is a couple, I guess, a couple different reasons. One, there, all other things equal tends to be a little bit more heat at the base of the clutch pack than at the top of it. And then the other reason, if you're dealing with uh, lugs, either in the case or um, the drum, you don't want a thin steel at the bottom where the tabs may get caught up underneath the base of the lugs. Because the lugs sometimes, in, you know, and I'm here I'm speaking generally transmission, sometimes like in these will not go all the way down to the bottom there'll be like a gap there. So if you get one of these tabs and they're permitted to go underneath that gap, they're gonna lock up the clutch and you'll have a no apply situation. So 
Unfortunately, there is no intermediate um, snap ring thickness between 105 thousandths and 88 thousandths, or 106 and 88. Uh, I wish there was. That would make things very nice. Um, so if we're a little too thick with this, I could just step down to that next size uh, increment down to say 98 thousandths and it'd be perfect probably. But as it is right now, this is what we're gonna try and see how we do. So let me reposition the camera and we'll load up the clutch again and take another measurement. If we're like 10 thou too tight, I could always swap to a later intermediate friction, meaning later 480E, it's 10 thousands thinner. So, and to be clear, because I've had a couple comments about this on a couple other videos, there's absolutely nothing wrong with mixing and matching brands of friction for a particular clutch pack, okay? Nothing wrong with it, absolutely not. Uh, some people tried to tell me there was, and uh, I mean, I'm generally polite when I respond to comments, but I kind of had to chuckle. You could put an Alto in here, you could put a Borg Warner, you can put a Revestis, it doesn't matter. Um, I generally try not to mix and match types of frictions. So like if I have uh, all high energy frictions and I need to swap, unless I'm desperate, I'm gonna look for another high energy friction that's maybe a little thinner in the case of this clutch pack, just for an example. But you can mix and match otherwise different thicknesses and different brands of friction plate without any problem whatsoever in any transmission manufactured by anybody on the face of the earth. Okay? Does not matter. I don't know what the hell's wrong here. So don't let anybody try to tell you that because it's not true. Is it ideal? No, but sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. All right, let me just by hand assess things. It feels kind of tight, so we may have to go with that thinner intermediate friction, but Let's take a look. I'm going to work the clutch pack a couple times and then we'll put the dial indicator in there. Ideally, you don't want to be below 30 thousandths on this clutch because you'll be dragging in first gear if you do. So if we're at like 40 to 45, maybe 50 on the high side, then we're good. We're done and we could put the intermediate braking band in and the direct clutch drum in. So, here's what I'm using for a plate, or a base I should say, for the base on the indicator. It's just another forward clutch hub. Makes it convenient. And it's stable enough so you could do a valid measurement. Now, you could use feeler gauges here too. Most of you are probably not going to want to monkey with something like this. Just use feeler gauges. It's the same principle. Uh, with the feeler gauges, you want to measure multiple spots and then just take an average. Um, the amount that you're going to vary is not going to be material. As long as you're not, you know, your technique isn't flawed in some way, you'll be fine. All right, we have the dial indicator at zero. No, we don't. We have it at one thou. We'll adjust it so it's at zero. And let's see what we got. Okay, it's not quite returning to zero. Thirty-seven, thirty-eight thousandths. So I'm at one and a half on the indicator. So we're like at yeah, thirty-eight, 
38 thousandths of an inch. If I install a thinner friction, I'll be at 48 thousandths of an inch. So let me deliberate and then I'll come back and tell you what I've decided to do and why. Okay, so dug into my drawer and I found a Borg Warner intermediate friction for a late 480 97 and up. These are 70 thousandths of an inch thick. Compared to our early alto friction, it's going to be about 80, 81 thousandths, 82 thousandths. So we're going to go ahead and install the 78 thousandths thick board warner and we're going to put it at the very top of the clutch pack. So any, whether it be a steel plate or a friction plate, you want all your thinner plates at the top and the thicker stuff at the bottom. So we'll see what sort of clearance this gives me and then I'll make a decision. And I know I told you I was going to come back with a decision, but I decided I'd show this part of the process to you. Like I said, this is uh, kind of geared toward DYIers and, you know, so I want to show you everything that's going on. But you're already getting a sense for the kinds of little challenges or you know bumps in the road that you might encounter on reassembly that maybe you didn't think about or didn't consider because you just you know you've never built these before okay for builders obviously this is something that's um, second nature I mean we keep all of these different spares you know uh, extra clutches extra steel plates extra backing plates extra snap rings you never know when you're going to need to mix and match and swap and improvise adapt and overcome you know so to speak on the spot i mean unless you like either reordering stuff over and over again until you finally get what you need or making multiple trips to your transport supplier in town you want to have this stuff so if you're a DYIer and you've not built a 4080E before, my first piece of advice for you would be to just, um, you know, make sure you keep all your steels and all your frictions. Because if you run into anything weird, you want to be able to go back to those parts for reference. All right? You want to be able to duplicate or replicate what was in there before. So don't throw anything out uh, other than maybe gaskets and whatnot, but all your lip seals, keep them on the pistons, all your uh, frictions and steels, if they're in half decent shape, uh, set them aside, but do not throw them out. Okay. Let's get the contraption back into position. And it is windy out. I think it's raining too. All right, I think that's uh, where it needs to be. Let me reposition so you can see the indicator and we'll give it a shot. All right, I think we're on zero. We're good to go. Let's see what clearance looks like now. Uh, we're not as stable as we thought. Assuming that's technically a valid reading, we're right under 50. All right, the indicator is walking, but it's traveling the same distance for the most part. Let me reset it. And then we'll try one more time. Yeah, this thing's walking around, but I guess it maybe will stay there. 
50 thousands. So 12 thousands variance or 12 thousand difference. So what this means is we'll have either a slightly firmer shift if we stay with this in the one two or a slightly softer shift if we decide to put that other clutch pack back in there, the one that's a little bit thicker. So again, now I'll deliberate and then I'll come back and let you know exactly what I decided to do. All right, we're gonna try out a new combo. So we have two TH400 flat steels, two 4080E early flat steels. We have 4080E frictions, all alto high energy. And then we're gonna step down from the 106 thou thick snap ring to the 88 thou thick snap ring. What I'm shooting for here, what I really want is between 40 and 45 thousandths of an inch clearance. I mean, it's not the end of the world if I'm a little under my 10 thou per friction standard, which I would be if I went with the stack up that saw me use a thinner, later 480 intermediate friction of 70 thou. Uh, the rest held the same in that 100 and thick thou snap ring. And yes, I know clearance is likely to open up, but ideally just so I could sleep at night because I'm a little obsessive when it comes to this stuff, I want to have the numbers be where I'm comfortable with them. And I don't know, what is it with me today in this thing? It's a fight me every step of the way. I don't know why. So what's the moral of the story here, if you haven't figured it out already? I would purchase two snap rings, the 88 and the 106. And then I would also purchase two TH400 flat steels for the intermediates. Okay, that feels like it's a little bit looser than that 38 thou combo, the one that I just kind of enunciated. But we'll see. We'll see. Do you have to be this obsessive? Eh. I mean, that's up to you, you know. If you never built one of these before, you're probably going to err on the side of conservatism. In other words, you're going to be um, very strict, just like I'm being right here. I just want to make sure that the thing's straight up and down. All right, let me reposition the camera real quick and then you'll get a much better view of the indicator that you have right now. All right, let's see what this yields. That's even tighter. So I bet if I do this and swap in Elite Model Friction, I'll be right where I need to be. So here's the uh, 70 thou friction. Again, in a stock application, you have a lot of flexibility. Now, if this was high performance, we would actually go with the original stack up. The original stack up was actually fine for something that's gonna um, go down the track because if you're shifting at 6,000 RPM from one to two, before you actually make that shift, you're gonna be in first gear. I mean, you know, especially if you're running a trans brake, I mean, you know, you're gonna launch at like 6,000 RPM. And so you last thing you need is drag on these clutches because they'll glaze them and you'll have all kind of uh, 
what uh, Chris at CK Performance refers to as spin losses, uh, meaning you're going to lose horsepower. So for a um, performance deal, you know, the 50 to 60 thousandths range is fine, but for what we're trying to do, I'd rather keep it a little more civilized versus uh, wild and crazy. Okay, that's perfect. We'll return in one thou below zero. Forty-five thousand. Okay, that's perfectly fine. So we got two TH four hundred flat steels, two four LEDE uh, flat steels, and eighty-eight thousands Chrysler direct clutch drum snap ring, the original backing plate, no wave plate, and we're at 44, 45 thousandths. Okay, good to go. All right, uh, let me reposition the camera and then I'll dunk that intermediate band in fluid. We'll stick it in there and then we'll install the direct clutch drum. And uh, from there, it's just the forward drum, uh, the overdrive section, you know, including the overdrive planet, coast clutch drum, and the overdrive clutch basket itself. And then from there, we'll work on the pump, get that sorted, and then finish this uh, case up so that we can do final assembly. We'll do a case air check like usual, and then we'll uh, move on to installing all the other stuff. All right, for your intermediate band, this is not a shifting band per se, it's a braking band, so for engine braking, uh, what you want to do is just get it situated and then maybe expand it just a little bit. Okay, you don't have to get too rough with it, just a little bit so that you can be sure that the direct drum in its entirety will pass inside of it. Situate it on the band anchor and then just expand it just a little bit. All right, with the drum itself, there is a special tool that you could use to lower the drum and mesh it with the uh, intermediate clutch pack. So you also have a special tool that will align all of the teeth on the intermediate clutch. So this is a Kentmore tool and it is Forgot where they uh, actually stuck the uh, the stamp. It's going to be J two four three nine six K M. It's none one of those tools again that is a nice to have, not a must have. If you don't have it, don't worry about it. You don't need it. Okay, you can just use a screwdriver and just do the best you can to align your teeth, and then. If you don't have the other tool, the lifting tool, which is going to be J38733, if you don't have this tool either, no big deal. Just take the clutches out of the drum and then lower it in, mesh it by hand, and then put the clutch pack back into it. And that's it. And it just checks frag rotation, and then you want to carefully lower the direct drum into the case. Let it mesh with the splines on the intermediate shaft. And then you're going to have to monkey with it to get it to mesh onto and mate with the intermediate clutch pack. Okay, it's not anywhere near close to being on. Okay, now I think we may be on. So 
The surefire test here to do is just simply work the intermediate clutch. Put air in there and if the direct drum starts jumping around, you know you have a little bit more work to do to get it fully seated. It's probably stuck on that bottom friction on the intermediate, but I think I'm fully meshed because I see the relationship between the splines on the direct drum and uh, you know where the top of the sun gear shaft is sitting. I think I'm meshed. So let's see if I'm wrong or right. Do a quick air check on the intermediate clutch. Okay, looks like I'm wrong because it's moving. So when it's moving like that, we got one more tooth to go. And you can hear it. In fact, I shouldn't have even spoken because uh, I actually heard that tooth dragging. You hear it, see that? All right, let me try it again. Okay, now we're good. A little sloppy. Sometimes they go in nice and easy. Other times they'll fight you. It's guaranteed if you're filming a video and you're trying to, you know, present yourself as if you know what you're doing, you know, they're going to go and push back. They're going to, you know, they're going to create all kinds of problems for you. All right, now we'll check the uh, direct. So if you have a rubber tip nozzle, you're going to have to take the tip off. Okay. This nozzle does not fit perfect. And then for high reverse, I mean, there's going to be a whole lot of whooshing. Okay, that's coming out of the direct clutch passage. I mean, I don't have a way to plug it up. I mean, I do, but I don't feel like going and get it. Basically, the bottom line is you want to make sure the clutch is working. The direct clutch will have bleed as well. Um, that's that bleeder ball capsule, so everything's fine. Um, what was I going to say? Transgo shift kit comes with little rubber inserts that go into the direct and the high reverse um, passages in the case to allow for a little bit better sealing. So, I mean, I, you know, I don't know if Sonics has something equivalent. If they do, they'll sell it individually. But if you want those things, you're going to have to buy the Transgo shift kit. Um, the only thing that I wouldn't use from their kits is the uh, pressure relief mechanism for EPC. They call it the EPC relief. And I've mentioned this in other 4LED videos, but that pressure mechanism tends to uh, malfunction. Uh, at least there's a, there's a track record of it happening. I've seen it myself a few times. And it's not pretty when it does because the transmission suffers by burning up. You, know, you got a massive pressure loss there right at the electronic pressure control solenoid and so you, you really don't want to use that thing but the rest of the kit is fine the hd2 i wouldn't recommend using that kit at all you really don't need it if you're overhauling the unit on the bench like this just dual feed the direct clutch internally it costs i don't know whatever the cost of that cup plug is and um just drill your hole sizes as you need to that sandwich riveted plate that comes in those kits um, uh, you know, it's prone to cross leaks. Uh, I've seen a couple of them come in where, you know, forwards burnt, directs burnt, intermediates burnt, and, you know, uh, customers told me that the trans was not abused, that there was no issues like that, but, you know, who knows. Anyway, uh, we'll go back to the bench. We'll finish up the forward drum, the uh, coast clutch drum, overdrive planet assembly. We'll do the ceiling rings and the input shaft, and then we'll assemble the pump. And then from there, we'll be ready to do a trial and play check for the front with everything in here. All right, forward clutch drum. Okay, 
Okay, so same thing, you wanna make sure that this um, leader ball here is working. You shake it, you take your pick, you can check it. Okay, as long as it's moving around in there, you'll be fine. All right, so uh, the, the drum seals on both the Ford and the Direct are not the same size. It's very, very difficult to mix them up because it's obvious uh, when just by putting one on top of the center section there, if that seal is correct or not. So don't worry too much about that. And um, like I said, if you're dual feeding the Direct, you're not gonna use that, uh, that seal on the drum anyway. But GM puts the seals in the TH400s, 480Es to kind of soften engagement. Now they call garage engagement into drives. So same deal, you want the lip facing you when you install it onto the drum. Okay, four drums, 480Es have a kind of a bad habit having ceiling ring groove wear in this location. So you want to always check this. Um, this one's fine, but about half the time when they come in, I see it. And so if you have that problem, you can do a couple things. One, if you have access to a machinist or you yourself have the tooling, you can ream this out and install a sleeve. Okay, it's a ductile iron repair sleeve and that sleeve will basically last a very, very, very long time. And that drum is done, assuming there's nothing else wrong with it. Um, you could also just replace with a reman. Reman drums will have the sleeves installed. They're a little bit more expensive um, otherwise than a good used. But if I think from Transtar, you can get the reman drums and you can get the good used drums. Uh, I want to say the good used drums will be, I don't know, somewhere in the, in the neighborhood of about 85, 90 bucks. Uh, I think the remands are a little bit more money than that. And then um, either way, you'll kind of solve that problem. All right, 97 and up had the bonded pistons introduced into the forward and the direct clutch. So you can retro those drums into these earlier units if you want. These don't have the, you know, the cracking issues that uh, the 4L60Es and the 700R4s did uh, with the forward pistons, they would like to crack, you know, as they got real old or a lot of miles or hard use. Um, anytime I do a 700R4 4L60E, I always swap out the aluminum pistons for the bonded steel and rubber late model pistons that went into those starting in the same year, 1997. All right, same deal with respect to your lip seals. Okay, those older seals, or old seals, I should say, these were not as 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 uh, hardened as the direct drums lip seals were. Direct, direct drum seals were kind of starting to get hard. And you saw some signs of slippage, which we didn't see in the forward um, clutches when we took this thing apart. But, you know, 150,000, 175,000, you know, it's, it's starting to get up there for transmissions in general. Some of these will last uh, double that, believe it or not. Uh, I've had one come in here about four years ago, guys swarping down, it had 350,000 miles or so. Original transmission, original truck, he was the original owner of the truck. It was like a 95 or 96 vehicle. Heavy duty, 25 or 3500, I can't remember exactly which, but the, uh, you know, what I did remember was the mileage and, and the transmission, if I'm recalling everything now correctly as I'm thinking about it, did not have anything done to it. I mean, it was all original. So, all right, same deal. Just with your lip seal tool, go all the way around, a little bit of downward pressure. Okay, you don't want to force anything, you just, you want to make sure though that you have everything installing, you know, as it should. Okay, um, I'm not going to film this, you saw how I did the direct clutch. So you just 
I'm putting the end of the snap ring here, one of them, right on the boss. All right, I'll be right back. Okay, forwards. So we have the same style of cushion plate as we did with the direct clutch. So we wanna put it like so. Okay, now if you were to reverse this, these tabs, back here I'll, I'll show you. If you were to put this thing in upside down, look what happens. See the tab? will be tempted to dip underneath the lug there. And then you won't be able to get it out when you're filming. Okay, frictions and steels, five and five. These are thinner, 75 thousandths or so thick. Looks like it's coming right in at 77. Okay, we're gonna leave the direct clutch hub, or excuse me, the forward clutch hub out. Okay, it's just sitting over there. We're not gonna put it in. Not right now, anyway. We're gonna do our clearance measurement, but we can't do that until the pump is assembled. So we test this on the bench via the pump. Okay, these snap rings are not selective. They're all the same, forward and direct. If you can get a hose in here, into this feed location, there's two of them, one on each side, then you can air check this independently of the pump, but you know, it's kind of a pain. Okay. So here's our post clutch. I don't mean to be reaching across like that, but I do it anyway. So here's our planet and our snap ring, and then we have our input shaft. So we have ceiling rings. Okay, uh, there are special tools to go ahead and expand and then resize these rings but you don't need them. So again, it depends on like how extreme quote unquote you wanna be. Uh, here I have a sizer that I use for my 204 R's. Okay, um, this will work for the smaller ones, but it's a little bit too small for the bigger ones. All right, but it's gonna be the same principle. This is the expander. And then here are the two sizers, the purpose built sizers for each of these um, pairs of ceiling rings. All right, so I'll do one of the ceiling rings with this one, and then I'll do one with the uh, other one. But the, the expander itself, I want to say, is between $30 and $40, and I think Adapt the Case makes it. Uh, they make really good tools, so, I mean, if you're going to splurge a little bit, you do a lot of these, then it may make sense just to buy uh, all the special tools that make this task and others like it more efficient and uh, generally lower procedural risk. So... You can carefully expand these ceiling rings over top the um, you know, over top here on the shaft. I'm not doing it because one, uh, I have to get this done, so I'm trying to cut out as many um, unnecessary minutes in terms of work time as I can. Uh, and then the other reason is because I just don't feel like burning through ceiling rings because I'll probably screw it up. Uh, again, Hiram Gutierrez, if you watched his 480 assembly video, he shows you um, doing the entire process without any special tools whatsoever. So expanding these rings and resizing them. I mean, he has all that stuff. He's a, you know, 
Uh, I would say he probably builds more transmissions in a year than I've built in five years. But, you know, he does show you that you can do it without these specialty tools. That one got a little foot, so I'm going to just reserve that one for the top. So again, even with the expander, you still have to be careful because, you know, it's going to take a little bit of effort to get it over the end of the shaft here. And again, you don't want to just hog it out because it'll be very difficult to get to resize if you do. And that's not what you want. Okay, so same deal, hose clamp, strip of rubber from that that you know rubber sheet kit. So if you have rubber sheets, and I think I mean that's a six by six sheet, but I think that they come in eight by eleven or you know fifteen by you know twelve by fifteen. I mean, I've seen all different sizes, so whatever you know, whatever size um, that works, that's that's what you need. I'm, let's see, I think I'm overlapped a little bit. So this is kind of why if you're in a production environment, you don't use these kinds of tools because it's just, you know, there's a lot of uh, opportunity for unnecessary minutes. And I think now that I'm looking at this a little more carefully, I think this might be too big, but we'll see. It's going to have to overlap. My worst case scenario, I screw it up and I'll just put another one on them. I have dozens and dozens of these things, but still, or rather not. Yeah, this is actually too big. So, it was kind of bowing out a section there and I didn't like that. So, we'll have to resort to our special tool. Sorry, I thought I was gonna be able to show you another low cost way of assembling or I should say installing these ceiling rings, but I guess not. Hey, there we go. But if you're going to build a 480, you're going to be spending a lot of money on parts. A lot of money. I mean, that's just unfortunately the nature of the beast now with the inflation, the way it's been over the past, you know, two, three years, I mean, really since 2020 and COVID and all that, and all that money entering the system. I mean, it's just, uh, it's just a problem. And the auto repair industry and the auto industry in general has been hammered, hammered uh, by inflationary pressures and pricing has just gone through the roof at the wholesale level and at the retail level. So you're gonna have issues trying to properly overhaul one of these units if you're on a shoestring budget. Because unlike 4L60Es and 700R4s where you can kind of get away with not doing some things like the bushings in the gear train, I mean, unless they're completely beat to hell, they can usually be reused in a stock or mild application, but not in anything performance. Um, but if you're just somebody looking to get back on the road and you, know, you wanna do your own refreshing, you know, prepare to spend some money on 4L80s that you're not going to have to spend on 4L60s. And then the 6Ls and the 8Ls, I mean, forget about it. I think the average cost of a full 6L80 in and out overhaul, you know, proper overhaul, all the updating that you need to do with those things is ranging between $6,000 and $8,000. All right, so GM remanufactured 6L80 transmission, three-year, 100,000-mile warranty. Um, a shop pulling your old unit and putting in the new one, flushing the lines, a cooler, uh, you know, filling it up, and then running the fast adapt relearn process. You're you're in that ballpark. You know, it's kind of a wide range because I've seen prices all over the place. You're in in that range. It's a lot more than the four speeds. So. And the 8Ls, uh, you know, I'm not overly familiar with them at this point. I've never rebuilt one. I've, I've never put my hands on one. So I do not know. 
All right, looks like this was not sized quite enough, so we'll have to be careful. We shimmy it in, or shimmy it down, I should say. Okay, this is milled, so you don't want to cut the inside of the ceiling ring. Okay, the design of these shafts changed. It's a subtle change, and it involves, you know, the interior of the feed passages for the forward clutch. And I want to say in 2001 is when they introduced a slightly different shaft that fed the forward clutch um, from both sides. And, and I, I'll, to be honest with you, I can't remember if it was here or here. But it's in the ATSG manual, so if you don't have that manual, like I said, it's, it will be linked in the description so that you do have it because you want it handy when you're rebuilding one of these. I mean, I have mine on the bench over there, just in case I need to refer to it. And these ceiling rings are gonna be a little more finicky than the 4L60, 700R4 ceiling rings and, and the 204Rs. Okay, not much, but it's going to be a little bit more of a process, just a little bit more tedious work effort to get them sized. Because you obviously don't want to break them, but you can't baby them either. All right, that little piece you saw, that's no big deal. All right, while you're doing this, just overlook your splines. I mean, you really should have done that prior, but then again, you should have done it during inspection. And I probably should have mentioned it earlier, but hindsight's always 2020. So if you're not yet building your transmission, you can just watch me build mine. At least you're aware of it. So these splines are pretty resilient. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I don't think I've seen more than maybe one or two have problems, uh, you know, and I've built I think about 400 of these, roughly speaking, a little over 400, 480 E's. Not a huge amount. I mean, you know, this is over 10 years, but my two most popular units, I should say my three most popular units are the 4L60E, the 700R4. I really consider them one transmission for all intents and purposes. And then the 4L80E. Um, and then from there, TH350s and 400s about the same frequency and then uh, Ford. So C6s, E4Ds, 4100s, um, I, I get them in from time to time. Sometimes they will come in like, you know, groups of three and four. Sometimes I'll get a customer that has like a small fleet and he'll just want me to go through the units just to freshen them up and, you know, so we don't have to worry about them. All right, you can leave your sizers in place for now while you assemble the uh, coast clutch drum. All right, so we have a new bushing here and a new bushing here. And we have our overdrive ruler assembly. All right, so first I'm gonna install, I'm gonna install the piston and then the return spring. That has to be done on the press with that three-legged clutch spring compressor tool that's adjustable because this thing is kind of a pain and I need real big snap ring pliers too to just to make it go quick. So from a tooling perspective, you know, get the biggest snap ring pliers that you can find that will expand this thing and then 
you know, be warned, unless you got a really, really beefy foot press or you're just a really big person, you know, you can put a lot of weight to it. Be, uh, be prepared to have to use a traditional press to install and compress that snap ring so that you can get this, uh, or excuse me, compress the return spring assembly so that you can install the snap ring. Okay, and we'll have it so that one of the ends is like this. All right, I will be right back. All right, should be good. Just want to double check, make sure you have all four bosses engaged. Okay, like I said, this snap ring can be a little bit difficult. All right, so here's our clutch pack. So, got uh, three frictions, three steels. Nothing is selective here. Okay, it's not a shifting clutch, it just comes on in your lower range settings. All right, so there were two designs of these overdrive roller assemblies. There was an early design and a late design. Okay, this is the early design. And in my humble opinion, I like this. This is the better of the two designs. Okay, the late design has uh, thinner rollers, and so they changed the, uh, obviously, the sprag itself, or excuse me, the roller clutch itself, the cam, and consequently, the drum, okay? Um, additionally, the outer race here in the planet, which these are pressed in by the way, also changed. So if you want to swap to an earlier design for high performance and you're working on a um, 2001 model year unit or newer, then you're going to want to retro the drum, a new sprag, and a planet. Okay. Now, like I said, you can remove this. You can overhaul this entire planet. So here's the snap ring, you just remove it, out come the pinions and all the little gears. You have your captured bearing here that obviously can come out. And then you can liberate this race. Okay, so pop quiz. Knowing what you know now about the relationship between sprag rotation and clutch basket orientation in the case, which direction do you think this assembly will freewheel and which direction will it lock up? Okay, if you guessed freewheel counterclockwise, you'd be correct because this sits in the case with the clutch basket facing to the rear. Okay, so all we're going to do is just kind of carefully seat it, rotating counterclockwise. Okay, first it has to mesh with the sun gear. All right. Okay, nice and easy. Now, if you have a situation, and I see this from time to time personally when I'm working on uh, the late, you know, second design uh, assemblies, if you have a situation where this is freewheeling in both directions, then either you have a defective roller assembly or you've installed it backwards. And more often than not, it's just simply because you didn't install it correctly. Uh, maybe it's on backwards, or that's kind of hard to do. But what usually is the problem is it's not fully locked on or locked in place on the cam. So it's not as big as a issue here with the first design. But the second design, you can run into that. Now, occasionally you'll get one bad out of the box, and it'll freewheel in both directions, and you know it is what it is. It's another reason you want to have all your old parts. You don't want to throw them out. So if you run into that and you're not certain, you think you have it right, just pop the old uh, roller clutch assembly into place and then test fit it. If that works, then you know you have one bad out of the box. All right, frictions and steels, clutch pack. So three frictions, three steels. And uh, looks like I got a Misplaced friction, yes I do. There we go. So nothing is selective in this drum. Your clearance is what it is. It's not a shifting clutch or a working clutch. You're using it for engine braking. So if you're towing and hauling, which you're probably doing to some extent if you have a 4L EDE, 
then this clutch will help out when it comes to negotiating steeper grades. So uh, this will have an up stamped into the plate. That obviously means it needs to face up. Okay. So now we're gonna install our planet for the final time. So we gotta mesh the planetary uh, pinions between the sun gear, and then we have to mesh our um, friction teeth on those splines. And then finally, we have to settle in on the roller clutch assembly. So notice the height between the uh, plate and the lugs. Hey, that's how you know you're meshed. I mean, you could check it. I mean, you could check it without doing what I just did. It's probably best to put the snap ring in first. Okay, this is another tough snap ring, so Wearing gloves, just watch out. Okay, so when the overdrive clutch is applied, this is going to release and freewheel. Okay, it's going to hold in all other gears and all other ranges. So if you have no movement in reverse or any forward range setting all of a sudden, chances are this overdrive roller assembly has failed. Okay, and if that's the case, you gotta open up the unit and at bare, bare minimum replace it. But let's face it, if you're doing that, you're rebuilding the whole transmission. All right, let's grab the uh, input shaft. Ceiling rings have been sitting around. The sizing tools, so they should be good. So all we're gonna do is situate our drum like so. Back, let me go get my snap ring pliers. You may have to persuade this. I mean, worst case scenario, I tear a ceiling ring and I'll have to install another one. But if you're a DIY, you may not have spares, so you just want to be really careful. And if it's not going in with that level of force, just take it back out and see what's up. And that's why I like to keep sizing tools on because sometimes it's just stubborn and it'll protrude a little bit. You know, I'm here, I'm talking about one of the ceiling rings and it'll get, you know, caught up. There we go. Either that or I was just doing something wrong, which is, you know, I would say that's the more likely possibility. That's why you don't force anything. You wanna make sure if there's something not right, you kinda of take a few steps back, take things apart, and then figure out what's up before proceeding because chances are it's just something like that, just a minor, you know, minor little manual assembly error. All right, I should have lubed that bushing, so let me take the opportunity to do that now.
You lube your ceiling rings, lube the pocket, just get it ready to go for the pump. All right, speaking of which, that's what we're gonna do next. Let me get this off the bench. Thing's kind of awkward. All right, pump body. Pump body is uh, very basic on these. All the work is done before you get to this point. So checking your clearances, making sure that clearance is exactly where it needs to be. You're within the range, I should say, where it needs to be. I think the range is something like seven ten thousandths to either twenty-eight ten thousandths or three thousandths, somewhere in there. I'll have to check my notes, but I know these met clearance. I mean, I checked them, but that's kind of what the uh, range is. So um, <clears throat> you want to lube everything up in here. And then here is that hole that you want to drill, okay, for drain back. All right, quarter of an inch, just going at a real shallow angle. So, you know, with it kind of like so, just coming with your bit about like this angle, as shallow as you can get it. So use a longer drill bit if you need to, longer than what is usually, you know, found hanging on the shelf at stores at Home Depot. All right, to pound in the seal is just a bushing driver of the right size, and that's pretty much it. So I'm not gonna do it on this bench. This bench is you know, real flimsy, so I'm gonna actually do it on the floor, and then we'll put the pump body together, and then we'll put it aside. We're not gonna put the O-ring on because I wanna make sure I do a trial fit with uh, the whole, you know everything in the case to get an end play reading. So we're probably gonna have to make an adjustment, at least one. Um, so there's no sense in putting no ring on. Okay, I'm gonna use a towel. And I'll put the pump body on a towel. And then I'm gonna use just a big giant bushing driver. And a hammer. Okay, install your driven gear first. All right, if you recall from the teardown video, if you watched it, I indexed. So again, it's just a, a, a way for me to know the orientation. I mean, I don't think it matters matching up the specific drive and driven gear teeth because they rotate differentially. So, I mean, all that matters is that you have the correct side facing in the correct direction. Okay, for the drive gear, they're gonna have dots, tell you face up. The aftermarket gears may or may not have this. Your flats are gonna face forward. So when we're looking at the pump like this, this is the rear of the pump body. And that's basically it. So no near, uh, nowhere near as involved as the 4L60E's 700R4's, 204R's. Just, you know, what you see is what you get with this one. Okay, I'm gonna drag the, um, all the valving for the pump cover, stator support. Drag that over. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna install the Sonex 480E LB1. It's a boost valve kit. So you have 
two O-rings. I think there was actually three O-rings in here. They give you an extra, I think. All right, you're going to have an updated PR spring. Here's the assembly there, wrapped up in cellophane or something. And then this is kind of some information uh, that they give you to check for wear at the crescent. And on the tips of the gear teeth, I mean, you know, we've already done that with the inspection. If your transmission comes in and it's largely unmodified, you know, it hasn't been gone through. Nobody put a shift kit in it, but it's not a lot of miles, relatively speaking, but it just looks stressed inside. All the, you know, all the friction um, elements, clutch packs, maybe band, the lower verse band. Um, you know, if uh, they all look stressed, then you really want to eyeball that, that pump body. All right, so here's the gear clearance. It was eight ten thousandths to 28 ten thousandths. And so this is kind of the uh, order in which it goes, okay? <clears throat> now, this is very important. Sonix makes a full-time line-to-lube pressure regulator valve. Okay, I happen to have one, and of course tripod's in the way, I'll get it out later, but um, we're going to install the uh, original valve in, and then we're going to do a, a test on the vac test machine. And if it fails that test, then I'll install the Sonix valve and see if that makes a difference. But same kind of uh, deal here. If you had issues or have issues with this pressure regulator valve or uh, the bore itself being real worn out, then chances are it's going to manifest in the form of damage to applied elements, excessive bushing wear, and other issues um, that you can see in the uh, transmission when you tear it down. And that's assuming you don't know nothing about it history-wise. If you have a customer for the unit and they can tell you, oh, it started to slip, oh, it was slipping here, it was slipping there, or it was delayed engagements, and, you know, if they are kind of handy enough, uh, to perform pressure testing, you can gather that information from them as well. And that will let you know that you really need to either hone in on the testing and visual inspection, inspection of both of these uh, castings, or just simply replace the pump if you don't have the test equipment. All right, these boost valve kits are not very expensive. I strongly recommend you put something other than the factory original boost valve and sleeve back in here. And that is because of highline pressure, the risks of highline pressure. And highline pressure is the result of wear with this uh, valve inside the sleeve. And when it wears like that, the valve may get stuck in the sleeve as it's oscillating back and forth and stick wide open so that you have max boost pressure all the time. And your electronic pressure control solenoid will not be able to stop it down. So you want to get rid of the factory boost in 4L80Es and TH400s. I think 4L80Es of the two transmissions or more vulnerable to this. I think. All right, so you're gonna reuse your spring here. We're gonna swap the factory PR spring with the Sonic spring. This is the OE uh, boost spring or boost valve spring. All right, so here's the differences between them. Sonics OE. Okay, I don't think this particular valve and sleeve are worn. Again, nothing that I saw in the transmission would lead me to believe they, uh, you know, they're problematic, but make sure you take the valve out because you see there's like some grease here. It looks like packing grease to me, so I'm gonna wipe all that off. And then we'll put a bunch of uh, blue assembly lube in there to hold it. And then check your O-rings too. Every once in a while I'll get one, uh, you know, where one of the O-rings is just rock hard. And 
you know, I don't know if Sonic still makes the replacement O-rings or extra O-rings as a package available anymore. I haven't seen it in a while. So I have a few extras, but not many. Okay, here is kind of a danger zone for this one because it has to traverse these cutouts to get to the ceiling ring, uh, groove rather. So what I'll do is I'll try to help it and just, you know, carefully maneuver it over this groove and I've already screwed it up. I mean, I guess this is necessary, but I really don't like I really don't like this aspect of the design. And this does not have an extra O-ring. So if you don't have extras and you break one, then you're going to have to go and buy another another kit which sucks. All right, now it's in. Okay, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna install these other two valves, uh, the TB, the TC enable and the torque converter limit valve. Uh, we'll also install the lockup valve and then I'll install the pressure regulator valve. All right, so WD everything up. And here's the instructions for testing your pump cover or slash stator support from Sonics. And we're gonna do that once this thing's assembled. So what you have here is um, pressure regulator, regulator valve test port location, um, your um, end plug testing. And then here's gonna be your uh, TCC control valve, pressure regulator, boost and then you have your uh, enable valve here and then you have your TCC limit valve all right so all these in red are where they have you test so we'll put this thing on the Sonics machine and we'll test everything like I said I mean I have absolutely zero concerns about this area because we're installing uh, you know, the o-ring boost valve so we'll check here I mean we'll check here don't get me wrong but uh, we'll check here We'll check here and here. These are the areas that we're gonna pay close attention to. If this fails, which I don't think it will, but if it fails, then um, we're gonna to have to install end plugs because the end plugs, when they wear, especially if a unit's been going through a few times, uh, you know, you'll have leakage there and that'll be an issue, okay? Um, so here's your converter clutch lockup valve. You test there and then, um, this is gonna be your, uh, I guess they're calling this the enable valve here. I don't know. It's the TCC lockup valve. But anyway, that's the instructions. So we'll keep those handy. All right. All right, first things first, um, you wanna get the end plugs installed. So for your converter clutch valve, 
This is going to be here. This is going to be the TCC lockup. It's going to be a small end plug that goes in the back here. So you just want to situate that. Okay. Situate that there. Just like that. And then grab your roll pin. Looks like I neglected to bring my hammer, so I'm gonna improvise. All right, now you're gonna have the spring in, then the valve. So spring is inboard, and then your valve. And then when you install this, this should seat the plug against the roll pin. Okay, now you have your plug. Oops. Let me go get my punch. Oh, the joys are not being prepared. I mean, I guess the good news is the likelihood of this being bad is minimal. You know, you want a nice tight fit in there. If it's real loose going in, then you're going to have to consider that this uh, plug may leak, which means you're going to have to consider replacing it with the Sonics O-ring plugs. And they all come in the zip kit. All right, like any other valve, um, if you can, you want to check and make sure it's moving. Okay, you can just kind of push on the plug itself. I mean, I, I don't know that I can get at it in any other real way. So here's going to be um, your limit valve and then your enable valve. Looks like the little selective washer there is going to get a bath. So valve first and spring. Just make sure it drops in under its own weight. Okay, you will sometimes see like a wear mark where the roll pin was. I had this plug upside down. And, you know, it's going to take a little bit of effort to get it to, to seat. I realize this is kind of ghetto, but... I guess I'm being really, really lazy for some reason. All 
All right, there we go. All right, well, we'll take a roll pin punch and we'll go through these roll pins, make sure they're 100% seated below flush before we do anything else. All right, let's locate our bore for our enable valve. So again, same deal. Valve, then spring. And then uh, screwdriver to compress the valve, or excuse me, compress the spring, so that you can get your cylindrical retainer in there. As long as it's below flush, you're fine. Okay, now we'll go ahead and we'll deal with the uh, pressure regulator and boost valve assemblies. All right, so first our end plug. And then the roll pin. And all these roll pins, you want this, this little lip here. Let's see if I can get that to focus. Okay, you want this, you want this lip to be facing this direction. Okay, now we'll install the PR valve itself and the spring. So I'm running out of battery. Okay, fresh battery. So some stuff may have moved around a little bit on the bench, but we're gonna install our PR valve. I'm gonna leave the spring off, so just install the valve. And it goes in just like you see. Just carefully maneuver it into position. And then what I'm gonna do, it's gonna sound a little odd, I'm going to install the original, okay, the original pressure regulator spring, the washer, the buffer spring, and the original boost valve, because I wanna test the PR valve. The reason I'm doing this is because I don't want to take a chance of, you know, going through multiple iterations of in and out, in and out with this boost valve because eventually these O-rings are going to break. All right, the other thing I want to do, and I haven't done it yet, is I want to just check this bore, make sure that there's no burrs or anything else that could cut those O-rings. And I guess it'll be interesting to see that when we test this thing, if <clears throat> there is any reason to believe that uh, this boost valve is not sealing here on the outside diameter. In other words, you know, where the Sonics boost valve has the O-rings, the O-rings will seal. And so, just more or less as a curiosity thing and, and you know, than anything else. Because um, I'm, like I said, I'm not real concerned about the VAC test results for um, the boost valve itself because, I mean, we got O-rings on them, so. So all the more reason to have your other parts handy. All right, I'm gonna go to the vac test machine and uh, we'll vac test all the different circuits here on the pump cover. All right, we're gonna go ahead and test the pump cover slash stator support. Uh, we have all of our valving in, including the uh, old boost valve and sleeve temporarily so that we can um, test that and the pressure regulator valve. I mean, we're just testing the boost valve for curiosity's sake, nothing more. Uh, so we're gonna test four different locations, uh, generally speaking, 
And with the boost valve, there's two locations in one kind of. You have the uh, outboard side here, and then you have the inboard side here. Okay. And then for your lockup valve, the TCC control valve, uh, you're going to have this circuit right here. And then for your uh, limit valve, you're going to have this circuit right here. And when we test this, there's a little orifice right here. We have to plug that with a finger. And then we're going to test the um, end plug here for the pressure regulator valve. And we're going to use the uh, hose itself and stick it right in this orifice right here. All right, um, to calibrate this machine, it's a very straightforward process. I'll just walk you through real quick. So you're going to take your hose that comes from the test uh, fitting and you're going to stick it in the calibration receptacle here. Make sure it's fully installed. All right, and then from there, you're going to turn the machine on. And when you turn the machine on, if this tester hasn't been used in a while or it's, you know, brand new out of the box, the needle is going to be somewhere in this range between 0 and 10. All right, when you turn it on wherever it is you're going to adjust your pump valve okay you have your bleeder valve and your pump valve you're going to adjust your pump valve so that it's reading a steady five inches of lift once you do that you're going to stick a finger on the calibration port that's right over here you can't see it but it's you know right next to the receptacle here and then the needle is going to jump up to between 20 and 30 you're going to adjust the bleeder valve until it reads 25 inches exactly okay so I already did this. As you can see, it's reading right at five inches. When I put my finger on the calibration port, it's now 25 inches. I take a finger away and it's now five inches. 25 and five. So we know we're ready to go. All right, so when I take that uh, hose, out of that calibration receptacle, I'm going to stick it right here. What we want to see is 15 inches of lift or more in this location because what we're doing is we're testing where here in the bore plug. Okay, we're right at zero. So this is going to take a little bit of effort because this tip is not perfectly flat. Okay, I have it lined up. So 15 inches. And I'll see if I can do it again. All right, there we go. We want to see 15 or more inches. All right, we'll put it back onto the test block. All right, the next circuit we're going to test is going to be for the uh, limit valve. I want to lay my little gasket here so I have access to this little port. All right, so wait for the five inches to show. You can hear the air whooshing out of this little orifice. Then stick a finger, and now we're sitting at 18 inches. Okay, we take it away, back to five inches. Okay, so that passes. So two down, and two more to go. So here, we're gonna test this bore plug here for the lockup valve on this side. This is going to be the side that's accessible from, you know, underneath the pan if you're trying to service the transmission when it's still in the vehicle. Okay, this shape's kind of eccentric, so you just have to make sure you're covering it entirely. So 20 inches, that's fine. Now we'll go ahead and we'll test our ports for the boost valve. Okay, this one's a little long. Let me see if I can... Okay. Yeah. Okay, 
here we go. All right, that's giving us nine inches. I'll make sure if I had that correct. Ten inches, and I'm clamping down on it. Okay, outboard side. And same, ten inches. So. 15 would have been preferable, but we're replacing this, so it's not that big of a deal. And that's why I like to install the Sonex O-ring boost valves, because uh, the sleeve just seals off that bore completely. I mean, I don't know how big of a deal this is, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, again, when we looked at the transmission, there was no signs of, uh, you know, burnt clutch packs on a widespread basis. So, um, my gut is telling me that this is actually probably not the end of the world, but... You know, I've never reused one of these, ever. I've always replaced uh, this valve and sleeve with either a Transgo or a Sonex equivalent. I think I used the Transgo stuff very early on when I first started building these, and then I switched over relatively quickly to the Sonex stuff, and that's what I've been using ever since. All right, back to the bench. All right, so now we're gonna take this boost assembly out of there, and then we're gonna install the Sonex parts. And I don't actually install the the Sonex boost valve on this bench I actually go to the other bench where there's a vise and uh, I can clamp this whole thing into the vise and it gives me a lot more leverage to install everything without you know too much messing around All right, so like I said, we're going to reuse the little buffer spring, and then we're going to install the Sonex um, equivalent pressure regulator spring. So all that other stuff will go elsewhere. I want to say the Sonex spring gives you another 10%. Um, or maybe 5%, I think it's another 5%, another 10 PSI of linear line pressure increase over the factory spring. And I'm just gonna put a little bit of lube. And let me actually check this bore. All I'm gonna do is take a finger and just go around the bore and just make sure I don't feel any burrs or anything else in here that is liable to cut one of those O-rings. Okay, you wanna also check, you know, the, the slots. So you can see the slots machined. Uh, and here I'm referring to these two, right here. These two slots. That's where your burrs are gonna likely be, okay? But that bore actually feels pretty good. No concerns, so I'm just gonna lube it up heavily with assembly lube so that, uh, again, there's no problems the rings going in. I mean, if you cut the rings, it kind of defeats the purpose of having these rings. The sleeve's outer diameter itself is exactly the same as a factory sleeve. So if you do cut one of the O-rings just accidentally, you know, it's probably not the end of the world, but if at all possible, you want to avoid it. Now, like I said, the whole benefit of the system is to seal off that bore completely so that you don't have any kind of leakage at all whatsoever. Okay, we're going to take this over to the other bench and then I'll install it there. All right, when you're using a vise, uh, use soft jaws and then it may be a good idea to put some rags. Main thing is you don't want to mar up the uh, stator's working surface. All right, go extra on the lube here. And then lube up your O-rings. Get them all thoroughly saturated. All right, the cut side of the washer is gonna face down, so there is a subtle difference. 
I mean, if you mess this up, I really, I really couldn't tell you what the consequences, if any, are. But that's the way it's technically supposed to go. Oh, come on, get in there. Get in there. All right, just carefully lower your assembly into position. Kind of jostle it if you need to. Like I said, this is a very tight fit, even without these O-rings, and that's what you want. You want a nice tight fit. Okay, so now we're making contact between the first O-ring and the inner diameter of the bore. Doesn't want to go right away. Don't force it. I mean, it's going to take some effort regardless, and where the tripod is is exactly where I'd be standing. So um, I'd have like all my weight available to me, much better leverage. And I'm not trying to make excuses or anything, but just saying, when you go to do this yourself, you want to make sure that you have some maximum leverage. And the way I'm positioned here, it, it, it doesn't really allow for that. Now right, we're going to try one more time to get it in, and then I'm going to use a hammer and a socket. And again, it, it just loves to grab one glove. It looks like we're making some more progress, a little bit better this time around. All right, another example of where you don't want to force anything, you want to make sure that there's nothing getting caught up in a way that would damage something. So here's a socket. It's a 916th, uh, which you call it, it's not it's the wrong size. Um, you need something a little bit narrower than that. Okay, all I'm trying to do here is just test the movement. Okay, that feels perfectly fine to me. So I just got to use whatever's around. All right, we're good with the uh, assembly of the valving and the pump cover. We just have to remove these ceiling rings and install the other ones. All right, before we go any further, I do want to recheck these boost valve ports with the Sonics assembly installed. So just curious to see what the difference is. Um, I'm sure you are too. So we'll get our gas positioned, crank up the machine. And so this is going to be the inboard port that we're going to test first. Uh, this looks like it's holding 15 inches, so that's an improvement of 5 inches over the factory boost assembly. So here is the outboard side. Okay, and that's holding 25 inches of lift. That is a perfect seal. Okay, in fact, it was difficult for me to... Uh, get this little gasket off of there. All right, so this is good to go. Uh, that's why I like using the Sonics O-ring boost valves because <clears throat> they do a great job of restoring what otherwise could be a worn out bore or just an imperfect seal between the sleeve and the inner diameter of the casting. All right, let's move on. All right, last thing I'm gonna do with this thing is just take those ceiling rings off. So these are one piece Teflon ceiling rings, old school. So these are not in production anymore, at least as far as I know. Because I like them for the later 4L80s for anything performance oriented. So uh, that 
larger sizing tool that you saw earlier. I mean, I think they have the exact same Kenmore J number, but uh, the larger aluminum colored one is for, you know, sizing those ceiling rings onto the stator here. All right, when we do our end plate check, I'm gonna just start with the original um, selective washer that came out of here. My advice to you, uh, if you're a first time builder, is, and I think I mentioned this before, but make sure you buy um, a couple of other sizes. What I would do is I would get whatever size came out of the transmission, the next size thinner and the next size thicker. All right. I would say about 80 to 90 percent of the time one of those three are going to work uh, you may get a weird situation if you're doing a case swap or you're swapping a lot of hard parts that uh, you know that won't work so um, you know there's always going to be exceptions to the rule but generally speaking if, especially if you're not swapping or exchanging or replacing anything wholesale this the one size down or the one size up one of those three should work should give you the end play you need and again, you want to be um, greater than, uh, in terms of the number, greater than the rear end play on a net basis. All right, let's go ahead and uh, put together the overdrive clutch assembly. So you grab your forward drum because you're going to use this as a platform. And then you're going to have two lip seals here. Okay, there's the pump o-ring, we'll get that out of the way. Get the, uh, the turn spring out of the way and the snap ring, and then we'll go over how to differentiate these two lip seals. Alright, the larger of the two lip seals is going to actually install onto the piston. Alright, so just note the direction that the lip seal is facing. So this is the ceiling surface, and then the body is what you know, goes into the groove. Okay, so we'll take that off. All right, so as you can see, we have the body here, and then we have the lip seal itself here. So all we're gonna do is look for a seal that basically matches that profile. All right, looking at this one. Okay. And you have this one. So when they're kind of matched up, this seal here fits the profile and it looks a little bigger physically. And when you install it, the body is going to go inboard into the groove. Just like the old seal that came out. Go all the way around, check it, make sure it's fully seated in that groove. That's basically it. All right. This is going to be the seal for the housing. So here the lip seal's facing, you know, outward. So it's facing the clutch pack. As you can see, they match. So just fish it in, feed it in, however, until it's in all the way around. Make sure it's not getting caught underneath the piston, which it will do. All right, so you're gonna need to use your forward drum as a platform. And so you wanna situate your uh, lip seals like this, okay? And then you're gonna flip this around so that you have a platform that you can then work your seals all the way inside their respective bores, okay?
or I guess I should have said you can just situate the piston upside down on the drum and then carefully lower the housing on top of it. It would have made too much sense for me to do that, so I, I did it, you know, the more cumbersome and less sensical way. All right, so here's how I specifically do this. I put the forward drum right on the edge of the bench. Okay, right on the edge of the bench. And then I take the housing and sit it like so. All right, because what I need to do is I need to have access not only to the seal and the housing, I have to have access to the seal that's on the piston. And the only way for me to do that is to approach it from underneath with the lip seal tool. And this is where a blade style tool is going to be most optimal. Now, Ken Moore makes a um, install set that literally makes this job take about 10 seconds or less. You put the, uh, you know, two tools and you situate them. Uh, I don't have the set, so I'm not exactly sure how, how to do it, but you just situate them underneath or, or whatever, however they tell you. And then once you have the tool fully installed, you just press down on this and it installs and it's literally done. So if you're doing 480E after 480E, then I would recommend you pick up that tool. I don't have it because I don't do enough of them to justify the 400 to $500 that set costs. I mean, it's kind of atrocious, but that's how much I see them go for on eBay. Every once in a while, I'll see one uh, a little bit less expensive, but a lot of times it's missing one of the two uh, components. And obviously that doesn't, you know, make it all that appealing. So just work your seal in, you know, just like any other lip seal, you just want to be careful with it. Put a little bit of downward pressure here on the housing. Okay, once you think you have it all the way around, you know, double check. But once you think you have it, then you can go underneath and you can start you can start persuading the uh, seal that's on the piston into position. And then once you have them both, you're going to leave it here on the drum. You're going to have to stick that um, return spring assembly on top and work the snap ring into the groove by literally pressing down on it. That's probably the trickiest aspect of the whole job, to be perfectly honest with you. So all I'm doing is taking my lip seal tool and I'm going all the way around giving a little bit of downward force, a little downward pressure on the housing and then rotating the forward drum. Okay, we're almost there. Okay, these two surfaces here have to be flush with each other. So we're not yet home free, but we're close. And try not to rotate either the piston or the housing, just rotate the drum underneath of it. Okay, so that's basically it. Now this part can be tricky because it's going to take some force and some strength to uh, work the snap ring in. And as much as I don't want to, I'm going to have to take off my gloves because I'm constantly getting gloves stuck in between the, uh, the body of the return spring assembly and the snap ring. Okay, so we're going to leave it on the forward drum. And then all you're going to do is compress the return spring until you can get one end in. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get one end in that allows me to, you know, locate the end of the snap ring on the locking boss. So 
So it came out. So you just gotta work it in. If you can get two, you know, two bosses engaged, then that makes a big difference. So it'll be kind of a fight until you can get two locking bosses engaged. And to be honest with you, I'm not sure if there is a special tool for this. I wish there was, but I don't know that there is. I think the special tool is just your body weight and elbow grease. So like I said, it's getting that second, that second locking tab engaged is the challenge in my mind. Check it over, make sure everything's good. Nothing looks awry. All right, now we're gonna install the clutch and air check it. So locate your narrow lug here. That's where your, uh, your little cutout on your steels are gonna go. So you start with a steel plate and then Steel friction, steel friction, steel friction, steel friction, and then backing plate. In uh, 99 and up, they changed the housing, uh, they changed the case too. And what they did is they installed a uh, stabilizer pin and that pin um, meshed with a cutout in the apply plate, which is completely different than this, insofar as it had this big wide flange. And, and so I guess the rationale was to prevent this clutch pack from applying asymmetrically in you know in the basket here so I'm gonna exaggerate this but I'm thinking that this is what was happening so one side would apply and then the other side and it was happening enough and it was significant enough to cause premature failure uh, in some in some of these transmissions all right so we'll check apply Apply seems good. All right, so now I'm gonna actually take out the clutch. If I can get the snap ring out, that is. All right, so now the basket and um, piston itself is ready for assembly into the case. So let's go ahead and deal with the forward clutch drum. All right, this bearing doesn't go here, obviously. All right, we haven't measured clearance yet in this thing but you'll see the relationship 
looks identical to that of the direct clutch drum. So I would imagine you have a similar clearance and the spec calls for a similar clearance. I mean, you can run these a little bit tighter because this is an on-working clutch. Once it's on in any forward range setting, it never comes off. So if it was a working clutch, then we'd have to be a little bit more stringent in terms of how we treated clearance and it would require more clearance than it otherwise would. Uh, A4ODs, A4OD, uh, AODs, 4R70-75Ws, um, they actually have a forward clutch that works. It comes off in overdrive. So if you don't have enough clearance, it's, you know, it's going to drag. All right, I'm just going to get my hands dirty. So you have two of these uh, little thrust washers. The bronze one goes inside the hub and then the plastic one goes on the outside of the hub. All right. Once we have the pump fully assembled, then I'll test, uh, or I'll check my clearance as I'm testing the drum for apply. All right, this side of the bearing faces you. Okay, I'm gonna go wash my hands and then uh, we'll start putting stuff into the case. Uh, like I said, this is preliminary. We're gonna take all this stuff back out once we get a fix on what net end play is gonna be. Um, in fact, you know what, before I even do that, uh, let me reposition the camera on the foot press so that we can measure that spacing between the snap ring and the flange or you know body of the planet before we put that in the case because we need that information. All right, we have the indicator set up and I'm zoomed in real close because frankly the glare is just overpowering and won't be able to see much of anything. And I'm also gonna hold a notepad so that we can kind of make out what the numbers are. Um, what we're gonna do is push up on the input shaft and see how much travel we have before the snap ring stops the travel, okay? That's basically all we're doing here. So just push up. So 20 thousandths of an inch. All right, we have eight thousandths in the rear. Or I think we were kind of um, vacillating between eight and nine thousandths. Let's just call it nine thousandths. So that's 29 thousandths of uh, travel that we have to net out. So here we would want to see something on the order of, so, 49 thousandths, that would leave us 20 thousandths of front end play. If we see 49 thousandths total travel when we do the end plate check, um, that would leave us 20 thousandths worth of end play. Okay, uh, 25, or excuse me, 22 is the max spec for uh, the front. So in reality, um, I'd probably wanna see something like 44-ish, 45, and that would give us a measurement of 15 thousandths for front end play and you know that's on a net basis and that would be perfect so if we can accomplish that then i mean the case will be sitting pretty now we're going to just go ahead and assemble the pump halves so let me scooch this over So just lube up your working surfaces on the face of your gears. Now maybe get the bushing and the seal one more time. All right, then grab your pump cover, lube it up as well. Just get everything nice and saturated. So you know, this will protect against any kind of dry startups. And then from there, um, all you need to do is just match your channels here, okay? These are your clutch circuits with those on the uh, pump body. That's basically it. All right, so 
We have our ceiling rings. They are literally the last things to go on. Just carefully lay it over and then double check alignment. So we got five pump half bolts and they all get 18 foot pounds. And same with the pump to case. All right, we have an alignment tool. So you wanna use that. You can use the case itself to align your pump halves. Um, I use the cases to check them, but you know, you can use to actually physically align the two halves. And this compressor is like barely big enough to accommodate these pumps. So just check it all the way around, make sure that no parts of the, the tool are kind of slipped below the parting line. A 13 millimeter. So every other bolt until they're all torqued. All right, just like anything else, you wanna be deliberate with your torquing. You don't wanna to get too crazy. I'm going to just check and make sure that all is good. All right, just do a quick visual all the way around. Yeah, if you see anything hanging over or under, you want to flag that. Like this area may or may not be in perfect alignment. Um, if you're just a little bit out, you'll know it. All right, now we're gonna finally install our stator ceiling rings. So again, these are the interlock style. So just carefully maneuver them into position in the groove. Okay, um, when this seats into the coast clutch drum, these ends will collapse and that will seal off the coast clutch apply circuit. All right, next go ahead and grab your input shaft Close clutch drum overdrive planet assembly. Carefully lower it. Okay. And then go ahead and grab your forward drum. taking the clutch hub out. Okay, 
Yeah, you don't want it to seat quite like that, but. Okay, um, this viewing angle isn't optimal. Let me reposition the camera real quick and then we'll resume. All right, I think that's a little better. So we're basically gonna do the same exercise here when it comes to assessing and measuring for clearance um, that we did with the direct clutch drum. So you grab your dial calipers and basically we're gonna take measurements. I'll just do all four sides so that we can use this to calculate our total clearance. Okay, I don't think that was quite right. Okay, this is telling me 50 thousandths beneath, which is an awful lot. And 50 thousandths, 50 actually, 54 thousandths. That's 60 thousandths. Sixty thousandths. And then this is, well, it's giving me 45, but again, I don't think that's quite right. So 55. So between 55 and 60 thousand. All right. All right, so we're gonna apply air. I gotta turn the compressor back on. And then we'll go ahead and we'll apply air to see where we're at. Um, if we're too loose in here, then I'll just simply install a direct clutch flat steel and that should bring us into where we need to be. All right, we have the indicator set up. I know the lighting is not optimal, but uh, we have our forward clutch feed here and then this is gonna be our coast clutch feed. Okay, so coast clutch, forward. We measured 60 thousandths of an inch on the, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the distance between the ledge and the top of the forward friction. So now we're gonna see how much travel we have from the ledge to the uh, end of the snap ring in the groove. Okay, 15,000, so that's 75,000 clearance. That's kind of high. Um, the ATSG manual has like a, an enormous range that, uh, that they give for what's acceptable, but I like between 50 and 60. So um, let me go ahead and uh, see if I can swap in a direct clutch steel. They're a little thicker and see if I can bring that clearance into a little bit better agreement with what I like to see. All right, so here's the rest of the clutch pack. And then here are two different steels. So we have the direct steel on the top and then we have the forward steel underneath of it. So we're gonna remove the forward steel and we're gonna install the direct steel on top of the cushion plate. And then the rest of the pack will be as is. So these plates are 80 thousandths thick on forwards, 90 thousandths on direct. So we know we have 15 thousandths worth of travel between the ledge and when the snap ring hits the top of its groove. So now let's go ahead and measure again. So we'll measure here, 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 and, and there. And see what kind of distance we have between the top ledge and the top of the friction. That's 30 thousandths. So 
screwed that up. 30. Thirty. And thirty. So thirty thousands. Fifteen is forty-five thousands. So the standard is uh, ten thousands per friction. You can run them a little bit tighter in the Ford because the Ford is always on. So we'll go ahead and install our backing plate once again, snap ring, and then we'll take just another reading. I mean, there's no reason it should be any different. Uh, really, the uh, variance is going to be in that, um, that ledge measurement. All right, I had to get that stable. Yeah, same 15 thousands. So that gives us 45 thousandths clearance. So it's a little bit less than the 10 thou per friction. But like I said, you can run the forwards a little bit tighter. Um, it's not the end of the world. Uh, you don't wanna, I don't like to run any of these clutches too loose. Um, just simply because in a stock to mild performance, to mild towing, off-roading, I want the, um, the pack to apply sooner rather than later. Okay. It'll give for like crisp shifts without bang shifting or very harsh engagement into drive in the case of forward clutch. Okay. The uh, coast clutch does have a clearance um, spec and that clearance is between 30 and 90 thousandths of an inch. So. We'll measure it, but you can't really do anything about it in terms of like changing your, you know, changing your measurement if for whatever reason you don't like it. There shouldn't be any reason that this clutch is out of spec, but stranger things have happened. And so we'll just check it just to be sure. So here's your coast clutch feed. So we're pretty much right at the top end, um, 85 thousandths clearance. I mean, it's within spec. It's a non-working clutch, maybe 83 thousandths. It's a not working clutch, so. All right, everything is applying as it should. All right, so you see this port right here? I didn't plug it because if you do and you put a full charge of air, your whole drum will lift off the pump. Okay. Like I said, I didn't want that to happen, so that's why I didn't put any uh, finger there. All right, so now we're in a position to uh, install both these drums as well as the overdrive clutch basket into the case will air check the overdrive section and then from there i'm just going to lather up the pump and the pump bore and we're going to install it for the final time and kind of keep our fingers crossed and hope that we are within where we need to be all right we have everything on the bench arranged in the order in which I'm going to install it into the case or onto the case. So I'm going to try to be as concise as I can with this last section. would like to get everything in within a half hour, 40 minutes or so in terms of run time. So uh, forward drum, overdrive clutch basket. Then we're going to install the uh, coast clutch drum slash input shaft OD planted assembly. And then we're going to follow that up with the overdrive clutch itself. And then the pump and everything associated with the pump. And then <clears throat> once we have our end play validated and we're good to go, then we'll flip the case over, install uh, all the stuff that goes on the belly of the case, including the uh, little manual second band servo, that filter, 
and then we'll put the case gasket in place and conduct a case air check. From there, it's on the parking linkage, wiring harness, valve body, and everything else. All right, first thing I'm gonna do is just lather everything up. I wanna actually do that before I even install anything. So you could put assembly lube all over the pump bore and all over the uh, overdrive clutch housing bearing surface. All right, the fit in here for the OD clutch housing isn't super tight. It's not like a 204R center support, but having assembly lube always helps. It can never hurt. So, okay. So for your Ford, <clears throat> Just double check, make sure you have your thrust washers in place here on your hub. And then you have your bearing. And then you're gonna have to mesh the direct clutch hub with all the frictions in the direct clutch. And then so, once we think we're fully seated, we'll go ahead and put air into the direct clutch pack and that will let us know if you know we're truly seated or not. If the drum, the forward drum moves when we introduce air into the direct drum, then we know we have one more friction to go. And I may have gotten super lucky because it normally doesn't go in quite like that. So let's go ahead and put some air. Okay. No movement. Good to go. Okay, now we're gonna install our clutch basket for the overdrive. Just line up your feed bolt, the six o'clock position, and then carefully drop it on in. Okay, like I said, this is not fussy. It's not gonna give you any kind of grief going in. So this is gonna be your feed bolt. <clears throat> As I mentioned in either earlier in this segment or part one of this video, Transgo shift kits will give you different feed bolts for for the uh, overdrive clutch housing. Uh, they're Allen head and they like to strip out. So it is my recommendation that you do not run those particular bolts. I've stripped out a couple of them and after that I learned my lesson. <clears throat> All right, next it's gonna be our overdrive planet slash coast clutch drum assembly. All right, the main thing here is you wanna ensure that there's no, um, like what I just did, you wanna make sure that you don't do that, okay? All right, this relationship has to be preserved. All right, feel free to double check it. But the bottom line is if you are caught up on one of those teeth in the coast clutch, then the thrust surface here will be too high relative to the rest of the case and you're going to have an interference fit when you install the pump. Like basically no in play, you'll be fully bound and you'll wonder why. Okay, I think we're good. So that's what the relationship looks like between the lugs and the top of that coast clutch pressure plate. Carefully lower it into position. I'll do a quick check on the ceiling rings. In fact, I'm gonna lubricate the ceiling rings in addition to the bore. I'll lubricate the journal as well for the bushing. Okay, so you have freewheel clock counterclockwise and it's locking to the clock. Okay, you can eyeball it from the uh, area just above the boost valve where my fingers are, just to make sure it's not sitting above this clutch basket. Next, will be the overdrive clutch. All right, there is a clearance associated with this clutch. It's 40 to 100 thousandths. 
So before we put the pump in, we're going to need to take a measurement of that. I mean, very rarely do I have issues being within that that spec. In fact, I can't remember the last time I had an issue or, you know, some sort of um, out of spec condition for this clutch. Okay, all you're doing is putting <clears throat> the little notch here at roughly the 12 o'clock position. Okay, just make a check of the pressure plate or backing plate. Make sure it's good. Maybe we've done that a long, long time ago, but. Okay, and then just carefully maneuver your snap ring into position and seat it. All right, as far as the feed bolt, it gets 144 inch pounds or 12 foot pounds. So I'm not actually going to torque it yet. We'll do that when the case is horizontal, belly up. Reason being is if, um, for whatever reason, I have to take anything out of here. Um, I don't know, I just don't feel like having to untorque it and then torque it again. All right, so let's just do a quick air check again. Okay, my nozzle's not gonna make a perfect seal on that Torx head. All right, it's Torx 40. All right, let me set the indicator up and then we'll go ahead and we'll do a uh, clearance check. All right, indicator's in position. Let's make sure we're zeroed. And let's see what we got. Okay, we're returning below zero. But it looks like it's the neighborhood of like 55,000, somewhere in there. Yeah, 55, 56 thousandths. All right, that's fine. And again, like I said, it's not gonna, the uh, nozzle's not creating any kind of decent seal between uh, the feed bolt because it's kind of torxed. Okay, so now we're ready to proceed with the pump. Overdrive clutch clearance is fine. So let me back the camera up and then we'll go ahead and install the pump. All right, so real quick on the pump, we have the original thrust washer installed. It's 90 thousandths thick, of course, with our sealing rings. And then I installed the pump O-ring. So what you wanna do is just lube the pump up. Just thoroughly saturate it with assembly lube, okay? That's ever the more critical with these transmissions because the pump is very heavy. So you don't want it to potentially getting seized or otherwise stuck in the pump or you know or gouging it or whatever so just lube it up as much as you can and then lube your ceiling rings as well ceiling rings journal get the bushing again pretty much everywhere on any surface it's going to make contact with anything you want lube I mean, that's the bottom line. All right, reposition the camera again and we'll install this thing. All right, first is your gasket. So up obviously reads up. Let's make sure all your bolt holes are aligned. Okay, this other selective washer is 75 thousandths thick. So if we're too tight here with the 90 thou, then we have the 75 thou. One of these two will get us into specification. Okay, if you haven't done it already, also lubricate your journal surfaces. We'll get the splines too and the whole shaft. 
Okay. You want go ahead and grab the uh, input shaft sealing rings and this bore here for the um, for the stator sealing rings. And then we're going to align it using a Phillips head screwdriver in this roughly three o'clock bolt hole location. All right, so here is your all your clutch circuitry. So you're going to position that at roughly six o'clock. Hey, like I said, this is very heavy. They make lifting tools that kind of assist you with lowering it into the case. So make use of them if you need to. All right, then what we're gonna do is thread in each of the pump to case bolts just to get them started. Okay, whatever you do, do not install the pump and seat it with the bolts. That is an outstanding way of stripping them out. Don't wanna be at this point only to have to evacuate the case again to install helo coil repair kits. Okay, just make sure they're all in. If they're not, like this one is not in. So maneuver the pump a little bit until you can get all these bolts threaded. I don't know, three, four, five threads, however many you can get. Okay, that's good. And then the next thing you're gonna do is seat it. So. You have three flats here for a drift punch and a hammer where you can seat this pump. So it doesn't matter which one you start on, you just wanna go equally in um, you know whatever direction. A few smacks for each one. And just go all the way around until it's seated. Hear that flat sound? That's how you know it's on the deck surface. All right, check your bolts. None of them should be bound up. They're not. So 13 millimeters, low power impact is fine. And I think my battery is about to give up the ghost here. <laughs> it literally just made it. Um, when you're doing this, if you notice the pump, you know, being seated or traveling a little bit deeper into the board, just stop immediately and then go back around with the uh, hammer and drift punch. Uh, like I said, last thing you want to do is seat this uh, with just the bolts. But if you use enough lube, That'll by itself mitigate some of the risk there for you in case you just make a mistake or you you know you don't realize it's not fully seated or whatever, but um, it's just a mistake you want to avoid. So 18 foot pounds. So you can start wherever you want and then just go in a crisscross pattern. That's generally what I will do. And you may be wondering why I'm not using a socket extension here. And that's frankly because I don't like them. Yeah, you lose some torque when you do that. But I don't know, you know, I don't have no idea how much, but you do. Okay, I'm just getting them a little bit seated, getting them snubbed. Okay, I'll do these. All 
I know I just did that one. So we just got this one. All right, this gasket will have to compress. So you may find that as you go around each bolt again, it will yield just a little bit more before it arrives at torque. Okay, that's normal. All right. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab my vice grips so I can set those up in preparation for the end play check. I think they make a special tool for this as well, but again, I don't, I don't have it. You obviously don't need it. It's a decent pair of vice grips like this, and then just go kind of back and forth with it. Make sure it's not bound. Okay, I can hear travel, so we may or may not be tight. This feels very, very similar to how it was when it came in. So. If we need to take the pump out again, that's no big deal. Um, I would recommend that you use a pump removal tool, or at least for these pumps because they're so heavy. Uh, I don't like trying to force it from a, you know underneath. That you, I mean, this is not a huge risk, but you can potentially gouge either the pump or mess up the case if you try to use pry bars or screwdrivers. So um, if we need to take this out and put that other spacer in there or that other uh, selective thrust washer in there, then you'll see me use a pump removal tool. All right, so I switched sides. Um, what you want to have handy is your long flat blade screwdriver that you used when you measured your rear end play or rear travel. Um, because what we want to do here is preload the rear section. Okay, that will take up all the slack that uh, you know should equal your end play measurement, or at least be within a thou or so. So for us, we're working with nine thousandths rear end play. Okay, we know we also have twenty thousandths on the uh, you know little snap ring that secures the input shaft to the overdrive planet. Um, that's got twenty thousandths worth of movement there. So between those two things, we're at 29,000. If you want, you can round it to 30 to make the math easier. So for us, we want to be somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, between 45 and 50,000, because that would give us a, a net end play in the front of 15 to 20,000. All right, so you can do this a couple ways. One, you can load the rear section, zero the indicator, and then pull up. Uh, I mean, you have to use both hands, and maybe that's a little cumbersome. Uh, the second method is to just simply calculate um, your you know your front end play based on information you already have and then i would recommend if you're going to do that just you know do a quick verification on the rear so you know load the rear see what the indicator is once you have a reading then hold the rear while you zero the indicator again then you know push up on the front uh subsequent all right so i'm going to load the rear and see where we're at Okay, so it's given us nine thousands. Let's see if it returns to zero. Okay, and the case movement is a product of this fixture and stand. All right, so now it may not return to zero, so just go ahead and press down on the input shaft. Okay, it didn't quite return to zero. I mean, I inadvertently touched it, so let's go ahead and try again. Just make sure it's crystal clear. Okay, so it's nine thousands. Dropping back down to two thousands. I'm gonna try my best not to touch the plunger itself. All right, now we're back to zero. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just lift up on the entire assembly or you know the entire input shaft. We know we have that nine thousandths in the rear. So here's the first bump. We're taking up all the slack between that snap ring and the overdrive planet and grooves on the input shaft. Now everything here on out is going to be a combination of front and rear end play. Okay, so that's forty thousandths. 
All right. So we're at 40 thousands. Back down to 20. Back down to zero. So let's lift up on the entire assembly again. So 40 thousands. Okay. We have a combined total of 29 thousands. So that means that we have 11 thousandths of an inch as far as net front end play. That's right, so the one we can load the rear section. Okay, now. Okay, 10 thousandths. Now, I'm going to zero it out. I know I'm at 9 thousandths, so I'm actually going to put it at 1 thou. And then we'll lift up. So 30 thousandths. All right, now we're back down below zero. As you can see, it went to 91 thousandths. So 10 to 11 thousandths and 9 thousandths, that is a little tight in the front. I would have preferred to see a net of 15. Okay, I would have preferred to see a net of 15. So let me see what I have. Um, if we install this washer, we're going to be 15 thousandths. Um, you know, we're going to be 15 thousandths uh, in terms of greater travel. That's going to be our gain, approximately 15. So if that's the case, then instead of being at 10, we'll be at 25, which would be too much in theory. So what I really need to do is find shims to use with this selective washer. All right, here's that pump removal tool that I was referring to earlier. You're not going to need this all that often, but in the times that you do, especially for you know real heavy pump assemblies like those in the 4080, uh, you're going to be glad you have it. So it basically clamps itself onto the stator and then uses a forcing screw to lift the pump out of the case. I mean, pretty simple and straightforward deal, but it makes quick work of getting the pump out. So. If you have a transmission too, like on teardown, that requires you to use a slide hammer. If you don't want to use a slide hammer, you can use this. It'll work just as well. Um, the main thing is what this does is allows you to lift the pump out safely, and at the same token, it doesn't disturb any of the other components. So you know they stay where they need to stay. So it minimizes the likelihood that you'll cut a ceiling ring or anything like that. and allows you to lift the pump free and clear the case without any difficulty. All right, so we have a 76 thousandths of an inch shim that I'm gonna try, or a you know, selective washer that I'm gonna, I'm gonna roll with. If this yields too much in the way of uh, net end play, like if we're over 22 thousandths net, then I'm going to literally be looking for a spacer uh, between um, a few minutes ago and now I searched all my selective washers for for this transmission, you know, for this pump and unfortunately I do not have any that are 80 thousandths thick and that's ideally what I would want. All right, we have everything back in the case, uh, 75 or 76 thousandths thick thrust washer. So what we're going to do is uh, make a check one more time and cross our fingers that we are within the specification that we need to be. So again, my target range here was 15 to 22 thousands or well, 15 to 20 specifically, 22 on the high side. That is the spec limit. Um, I will preface this by saying that if you're at 23, 24, maybe even 25, it's beyond spec and it's not ideal but on a stock application, you could skate by with that. Again, it's not ideal, but you can skate by. So if that's where we're at, then we're gonna skate by because um, I do not have anything else that I could throw at this thing at the moment. So I'll be searching for some shims, but, uh, and of course, case scenario, if I can get shims right away, then I'm just gonna take the pump out and put a shim in there. But let's see where we are at. If we are within specification, then we're done, so. All right, 
Let's go ahead and load the rear. Okay, I'm gonna move the uh, fixture a little bit. Okay, nine thousands on the rear. Twenty thousands to net out for our um, snap ring. So that's forty three thousands. So we are at 43 minus 20 is 23. You know, like I said, we are just outside spec. Now I'm just going to do a gross measurement. Fifty-one minus thirty is twenty-one. Oop. We're not returning to zero. So I'll make sure that that input shaft's all the way down. Fifty-one and a half. It is returning. A smidge below zero, 51 and a half, 52, 52 minus 30 is 22. So 22 to 23 thousandths, I'll live with that. Um, if this was a performance deal, I would need to shim this by five, six thousandths of an inch to get it where it needed to be. But on a stock application, this is not, you know, this is not going to be a problem. So, <clears throat> excuse me. All right, I'm going to call this done. So we'll take the indicator away. And then the last thing we're going to do with the case upright is install our torque converter clutch O-ring. All right, all these O-rings are green in the kits. I think there's some black O-rings too, actually, so I, sh so I shouldn't say that. Uh, there's some green ones and then I've seen some black ones. So anyway, all right, we're done here with respect to the case. So now we're gonna move on to the case belly, get this thing horizontal. There's a few things we need to tend to there and then we'll do a case air check. 